Welcome all of you uh, to this debate about uh, trans, queer, and uh, uh, feminist. Thank you, Jane. Uh, the order is purely coincidental. Uh, the debate is called Another Sport is Possible? Uh, question mark, exclamation mark, and a dot. Our diligent uh, yeah, proofreaders remove the dot. Uh, this is also purely coincidental. Jericho has a theory about this dot. It happens all the time. It's an important part of the title. Uh, you can explain it afterwards. Uh, there are two overlapping uh, events in Ljubljana this weekend. Uh, one starting tomorrow. That's an um, international uh, LGBT conference on uh, LGBT in sports. Uh, building bridges. Uh, it's also purely coincidental that it overlaps with Red Dawn's festival. I don't know if this is a real coincidence, or if the gay lobby <laughs> is so strong. In the <laughs> um, and Jelko is also a part of this conference, starting tomorrow. Uh, and Clemence, so yes. Uh, so, uh, I introduce Jelko. Uh, he is the founder of the Queer Sports Zagreb. It's, uh, this event is organized in cooperation with uh, Queer Sport Zagreb. He's also founder of the Multimedia Institute in Zagreb. He is here with us for the second time this year. Uh, he was here last year. So uh, the floor is yours, Welcome. <laughs> okay. well, it would be really nice if I could tra transgress my gender into more feminine and have <laughs> all ladies kind of. But unfortunately, I'll be. Uh, in English, it will be neutral for a while. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I had a, a chance last year to speak about LGBT queer sports idea as a general presentation last year at the festival. And uh, yeah, I felt okay that was maybe uh, a bit too early uh, for, for the development that was happening meanwhile and now we are like just two weeks too late to the peak time of, of talking about uh, gender identity, sexual um, orientation and sports uh, in, in regards to, to media attention to the Olympics. Uh, but actually the, the topic uh, we choose is a little bit less present in media. and. Uh, the fact that we would try to map uh, ideas or, or talk about different ideas and perspective and experiences of uh, trans, uh, queer or those who uh, express as feminists in sports or, or uh, is, is maybe an interesting uh, thing that there is a venue within a cultural festival, within uh, uh, Red Dawns, and uh, it's, it's not something that is uh, discussed most often in, in, in uh, uh, gay and lesbian conferences, at least not in this. So I would uh, use the opportunity to speak with people uh, who are, let's say, less present, but who also have a, a cultural perspective uh, uh, aside from experience of sport. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, say something about the title. Another sport is possible is, is basically the title of the exhibition uh, I did two years ago originally um, and it paraphrases this uh, another world is possible from Noam Chomsky uh, because he is like amazing intellectual who hates sport. <laughs> and of course, who can, who can blame him when, when his uh, experience of sport in USA is very specific and how he uh, reflects on it is basically uh, associating his experience through media and through hyper-commercial elite sport as this sport. Um, so I was interested in other experiences and uh, other po possibilities and other alternatives. So. I kind of flipped the coin to, to the other side and instead of uh, just saying that there is a possibility for another sport, I was curious about uh, 
what could be those possibilities, uh, but also I was interested in who can make these claims. This is why uh, there is an exclamation mark and, and a dot at the end that this, this, this is something that we definitely need to look for. So when I was uh, approaching the topic of this panel, I was also a little bit struggling with the idea how can one talk and structure a conversation in a clear feminist environment where we would preferably want to have all uh, speaking and all have inputs uh, rather than to have this, well, this is not like super imposed position, but uh, let's say uh, it, it somehow structures that we are the speakers. So please, if you feel like you have something to contribute uh, or you have some something to uh, ask any of us as uh, speakers to just immediately react rather than to wait uh, for, for the end or, or we are not having question, uh, uh, questions at the end but all through the uh, session. So at the start, just for an icebreaker, I wanted to show a brief part of a, a really interesting documentary that was made uh, by Okay. This was made by Tom Weller, uh, a trans athlete and, and filmmaker who was at Gay Games in uh, Cologne 2010 and he interviewed uh, trans people who were participating in predominantly gay uh, sports event. <laughs> I would like to 
tener la posibilidad de, de jugar en la categoría femenina y masculina, ambas. De, de masculina y femenina y Porque la categoría masculina es abierta. Porque por el medio es por el medio. Y la categoría femenina es para mujeres. Entonces, no puedo jugar en la categoría femenina por el riesgo y una... This is a documentary. He also did a fictional uh, movie and, and uh, one that is uh, more like experimental uh, video. Uh, the, the other artist is Jason Hall from the Justin Campaign, and uh, the, probably the most well known internationally uh, campaign that's fighting homophobia and transphobia in football. Uh, and Juliet was uh, one of the co-founders with, with Jason um, and uh, I would like you to, to maybe uh, briefly introduce to, to uh, those who are not familiar with, with the campaign so much and those who haven't followed since like where, where it went from, from the where, where you started and up until last weekend, and we were like super enthusiastic <laughs> over the, the, the news. It was. Yeah, okay, so the Justin campaign grew out of the, uh, the Brighton Bandits, which was one of the teams in the um, GFSN League, the Gay Football Supporters Network League in Britain. Uh, and Brighton, you know, is a city in Britain that's well known for its kind of LGBT and queer populations, and I was living there. And I joined the team, and I immediately met Jason Hall and a guy called Paul Windsor. And the three of us quickly realised that we were the most um, sort of radically, politically motivated people in the team in the sense of this kind of countercultural queer politics. Um, and also, that the three of us got on very well, and we had a really a uh, useful blend of personalities to start a campaign. Jason's very extrovert, very energetic. Uh, he was an artist and really wanting to do something important politically. He'd had a, a lot of big changes in his life and, and wanted to get into activism. And so a lot of the energy came from Jason and then a lot of the sort of thinking about the practicalities came from Paul and a lot of the kind of thinking through of the actual ideas uh, came came from me, I think, and what we ended up doing in the first year, which was when I was involved, was something something very cultural. It would be a matter of putting on art exhibitions, film screenings at the local cinema, so we'd get somebody like Peter Tatchell, who was quite interested in football, to come to a screening of a documentary about a gay football team and talk about it. Uh, we put on a kind of queer table football tournament at a big library in Brighton. We took it over for a day and we invited John Woo and Mark Butcher, who were these really interesting radical drag performers, to, to come and compare. And we, we took over um, the actual square in central Brighton and we set up a football pitch where people could come and play. And we launched the Justin Fashion All Stars, which is named after Justin Fashion who at that time was, I think, the only ever openly gay professional footballer anywhere, I think, uh, at least during his career. And so we launched the campaign from there, and it started off as this very interesting mix of activism and art. Uh, at that point, I left to, uh, to go away and, and start the process of gender reassignment, and I had some other things to do as well, uh, but that was the main one. Uh, and Jason and Paul carried on with the campaign for a while, and I think they've both left now. 
Um, I think I'm right in saying that the football v homophobia and then football v biphobia and football v transphobia campaigns grew out of the Justin campaign. Um, Justin Fashion News life was quite complicated in, in lots of ways and I think to move the campaign from something that was primarily involved with art to something that worked with governing bodies like the Football Association and professional football clubs, um, a campaign like Football v Homophobia, Football v Transphobia, was more useful for doing that. Um, I haven't been so involved with, with those campaigns, I think there are people in the audience who have been. But we do a, we do a mixture of, of, of uh, I do a mixture of things with them now. Um, quite recently training for, for football journalists in the UK to ask them to think about the language they use and the way they frame their stories and structure them um, to make them more LGBT friendly, to uh, suggest them why it's important that they take LGBT issues seriously. Uh, and we've started um, engaging directly with football clubs in the mainstream English leagues to set up um, LGBT supporters networks and um, you know the, the real kind of triumph of that for me personally uh, was was a week or two ago when I got to go on the pitch at half time at Norwich City who were the team I've supported since I was quite young and uh, during a Premier League game against Tottenham Hotspur and have a very high profile launch of the LGBT supporters group there and, and meet people at the club. Um, and there are groups at Tottenham and Arsenal, uh, I think Ipswich Town have just started one. Uh, there are lots of different supporters groups now. So what the original aim of the Justin campaign was, was to try and create an environment in which professional or amateur football players could feel comfortable coming out as LGBT or any you know, combination. Um, and we're starting to see that happen a bit more now, and we're also starting to see some kind of changes uh, in the supporters' culture. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I've been involved for the last few years. Really. So I'll just uh, go back to uh, what you said at the very beginning, which I think is very essential in terms of, uh, for example, comparing to the, the, the conference that is coming uh, up tomorrow is that most of the uh, gay and lesbian sport work uh, basically relies around organizing sport and sometimes it involves activism but it very rarely touches upon uh, questions of, of cultural and kind of media uh, presence and maybe uh, Justin campaign and uh, football versus homophobia are like exceptional examples where, where has been integrated in, in, into, and the fact that uh, it's not kind of exclusively owned by gay men or, or lesbian women, it makes it also very uh, unique. Uh, how it started. Um, also, you, you also have a, a media uh, background professionally, but you also have a different experience. Well, as, the experience. Uh, um uh, I started working with the TIP, the Paris Tournament, uh, for the um, to make a visibility for transgender people. And uh, well, the context is the TIP was created in, in 2003. 2003. Can I just interrupt something? Uh, I forgot to say in this movie, uh, Tom found I think 23 trans people out of. 6,000, I think, competitive participants, and just in terms of numbers, uh, the Paris tournament is around 1,000 or more participants. Yeah. 2,000. 2,000. So it's one of the biggest tournaments around. Yes. And, then and what, uh, what are the I, um, we see that the, um, we work for the integration of uh, about every every uh, everyone. But uh, we uh, saw that uh, the transgender people can came to, uh, to, to, to the competitions and uh, we, have, we wanted to increase the participation and uh, we started working in three axes. 
because we identified identify three axes. The first was the uh, transgender people, uh, why trans people don't want to participate. And uh, that was uh, very hard work because we had to make links with the um, transgender community and uh, use the ways that uh, they, uh, they take to, come to make uh, the communications. Um, that was the first work. The second work was to uh, talk about trans identities uh, to the clubs. Uh, that was very important for the visibility. And um, the third point was to uh, talk about uh, transphobia um, in society. Um, the first work was, was very interesting because we had to do everything. Uh, it was, uh, we wanted to start the work, but uh, when we start the searching for to know if something was made uh, anywhere for transgender people, I didn't find. And uh, the first one was to create uh, communications uh, by uh, one video to explain why uh, transgender people can come to participate in the uh, Paris tournament to explain uh, the values of sports and um, change the, the way to inscriptions, to change the uh, visibility, uh, to make the choice, to leave the choice of people, and choice the, the gender identity. And um, the second world was to work inside, inside the, the, the clubs to explain uh, about uh, transgender identity. Uh, to explain because um, uh, almost people don't know what is uh, uh, transgender people. They don't know, they don't know. Sometimes we think that it's transphobia, but uh, it's not, it's not easier than we want to know. Uh, it's just because they don't know. Uh, and that's why we can find some uh, some reaction of transphobia because people don't know. For example, the locals. Uh, sometimes they, the people, when they know that I, I make a transition uh, and I'm the locals uh, room for the ladies, they ask for me why she is here, but uh, they don't uh, they don't know about uh, trans identity. They don't know if I finish my class. Transition. They don't know if I change my uh, my ID. Uh, it's the people don't know. Don't we have to explain? We have to explain. That was the second work, and the the third work was to talk about transphobia in, in society, uh, and th that's very difficult because uh, um, when we ask to someone if, she, if he or she is transphobic, mm -hmm. they say, no, I'm inclusive. <laughs> but uh, some reactions uh, show that it's uh, transphobia. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to explain why it's a transphobic act. Uh, uh, for example, uh, ask if uh, the name, the last name, in the past, what, what was your name? Uh, it's very transphobic mm -hmm. to ask something like this. Um, now uh, we work uh, about three axes, and uh, last year we have uh, uh, increasing <coughs> participation of transgender people. This year we continue the, the same work that we we, got, we, uh, we start last year. Uh, uh, the inclusion of transgender people I start in 22 um, by a standard of visibility uh, and uh, show uh, what transgender people is. Uh, uh, the first work was information. Uh, 
um, what is very different, dif difficult for, for us is to, um, to explain to transgender people that it's necessary to, to practice sport. And uh, now uh, we have a, um, research from the uh, university, uh, Paris Diderot University, and uh, the research showed that um, when someone starts a uh, hormone therapy, they have uh, more risk, 15% more, to have uh, some problems of health. And uh, the practice, practice sport is very, uh, it's a wellness for, for, mm -hmm. for the, this population. So we start, we have to show transgender people, why they have to, to practice for. Yeah, I remember this was a re relatively recent discovery or recent advice to remain active through transition rather than to be like super safe and... Yes, yes, yes. We, uh, sometimes uh, transgender people don't want to practice for because uh, they are in a situation of fragility. Yeah because the health is not uh, very well, because we take home, you know, we have a uh, new therapy. But um, there are many other kind of difficulties. For example, someone that uh, make the operation, the transition, and uh, they can practice sport for many years because uh, we have no confidence with the, with the body. And, uh, that's why some people do not feel practice sport because they have fear. The first work for the people is to uh, appropriate the body. Uh, I think what, what is interesting for, for someone who took part in the uh, gay and lesbian sport circuit and knows uh, what are the percentages of people uh, who identify as strengths and who are. Uh, actively taking part is, is very low, but it's really interesting that it's uh, much higher in, in migrant communities. So, for example, uh, I remember uh, taking part in tournaments in Italy or, or in Spain, where I don't see these people traveling around the world. They have probably issues with, with papers, with, with, with income, with different things that are traveling, but locally they are present in relatively big numbers. So uh, there is like a, a trans, uh, almost full trans team of Peruvian migrants in Milano. There is a, a, a team in Barcelona, I know, in volleyball also. Uh, there are many Thai uh, players. Well, well uh, that's very interesting because uh, in Peru we have a very huge community of trans migrants. Yes. And uh, from South America. And uh, they practice sport. And they practice sport because uh, it's a way to uh, integrate society. It's a way to uh, make an a inclusive uh, uh, step and uh, to learn uh, language, for example, French. Uh, um, to, uh, to know how the healthcare uh, situation works, and um, that's why they, they work. But it's for trans community migrant, it's very important too because uh, we have a, a very high level of uh, uh, VIH uh, AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, uh, and actually we are. Uh, um, a search circle is working um, for for the transgender uh, person uh, to help to integrate society by this point. So this is where we maybe can touch up on an interesting topic that's more interesting for, for us coming from Eastern Europe about solidarity uh, through sports because uh, we don't have a big uh, trans communities, we don't even have organized gay and lesbian communities that we 
consider at the scale as it is in Western Europe. We basically skipped the sexual revolution, we skipped the big AIDS crisis. Well, it's true, like in Eastern Europe, we didn't have these big emancipatory <laughs> movements where we can have you know, gay and lesbian cultural centers, where we have uh, basically the, the communities are uh, around few events, around few uh, clubs, and, and uh, it, it's still very early in terms of uh, capacities that, that, that one can uh, claim uh, as a kind of community uh, presence and uh, visibility. Um, and, Olga is uh, coming from as a dramaturg from, from the field of culture, but also working uh, in activism as an editor uh, and as an educator in queer programs. So I'm interested in, in uh, what do you think, what makes uh, the position of someone doing LGBT queer sports in uh, Eastern Europe or queer? Um, yeah, well, um I'm going to say actually socialist heritage. <laughs> no, uh, 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 first, uh, uh, somehow I would like to reflect on what you said that we didn't have a, a sexual revolution in the sense and that kind of huge activist emancipatory moments. We didn't, not in the way that uh, we saw it in the West. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, 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 as well as you. Uh, it's also very difficult to say the West is a total, uh, some total system and also the Eastern Europe is some total system because there are so many differences. As well as now, for example, we have so much differences only within former Yugoslav republics. And they're really huge. Like, I don't know, Serbian experience is already completely different than Croatian, for example, not even to mention Slovenia and so on. But um, uh, 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 if, for example, we talk about Yugoslavia, you could say, at least when you look at the movies uh, from the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s, um, uh, until some certain kind of cultural backlash happened, you, uh, the sexuality is constantly in them. There is so much sexuality that it's completely incredible. So, uh, in that sense, uh, 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 some discourses on sexual emancipation were constantly present, at least in Yugoslavia, ever since, I don't know, let's say, 60s onwards uh, in some, uh, let's say, steps. Um, and then, okay, the big break happens, which uh, brings us back in the terms of working, uh, workers' rights, in terms of women's rights, and as well in the terms of LGBT rights, in that sense, because right in the moment when, for example, in Yugoslavia something starts happening, um, everything falls apart, and all the different republics start uh, uh, going in their own direction in, in that sense. I don't know, the, the half of the countries, in the, of the former countries in the war, and uh, activist groups start very different organizations. And now we are uh, uh, more or less in the situation, and that can be applied to the whole of Eastern Europe, that you're practically in the countries that were ravaged, more or less, uh, by, uh, you know, completely wild neoliberal politics that brought so many people to poverty, deindustrialized the countries, uh, uh, um, created some kind of political system that is uh, called democratic, but actually it just serves to maintain certain elites on the power, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And when you have that kind of context, um, the only, some of, uh, uh, and when you start making LGBT politics in that kind of context, and when you start uh, uh, importing actually concepts of how you do your activism and how you do your politics from the West and start applying them on, on the uh, space which has completely different uh, historical heritage, that's actually where we enter that weird gap and where uh, uh, we constantly find the, the, the troubles and where you, where you constantly find LGBT groups, uh, 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 queer groups uh, colliding with the rest of the society. And then we like to say, oh, but it's homophobic, it's so backwards, it's so not sensitive enough, we need a rights, and so But that whole talk comes from the perspective which is completely, uh, which is 
uh, uh, grounded in in the concepts that actually do not correspond to the to the actual social reality of the countries. And when it comes to the sport and, and the actual reality, we also witness that sport is actually ma mainstream sport is has been manipulated. Uh, uh, um, by mainly right, uh, political right, and mainly uh, 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 the, the whole uh, the talks about hooliganism on the uh, in the audience uh, the uh, that over uh, that spills uh, on the streets after that, uh, the whole iconography of contemporary uh, of, uh, sport fans who go and, and play sport, the whole. Uh, um, uh, statements that players give in football, for example, and so on and so on, is completely co-opted by mainly political right. And that also happens in the moment when uh, uh, um, uh, 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 that political right is one of the main enemies of any uh, kind of LGBT queer or organizing. So we're in a huge trouble if we stick to the politics that we have at the moment. And maybe the whole thing should be actually turned completely up, upside down. And uh, 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 if we start looking at the sport again as something as we actually need for I don't know, health reasons, happiness reasons, why we all do sports or like it, whatever, um, we actually need to gain the space back and to win it back. And I would somehow say that that cannot be done without some wider a uh, 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 um, uh, coalition of uh, many other disempowered uh, 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 groups within the society. It practically demands imagining and rebuilding the whole new uh, system of thinking, the whole new uh, uh, um, uh, way how to organize social movements, and uh, it of course demands insane amount of energy and. Uh, also to be brave and uh, 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 to be ready for many misunderstandings that can come along. Um, but it, I would say that it, it, it needs to be done. I mentioned you earlier this one example uh, that that is uh, 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 throughout, uh, for example, Yugoslavia, you had very often uh, workers, sport clubs uh, 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 that were sport clubs of the factories or uh, companies, state companies, uh, what, uh, that were organized. Sometimes they even played in professional leagues, and they uh, most of them had their also women section, like we had men football club, women football club, and they would all compete. And some of the players who were factory workers later would become uh, football professionals. I heard about the story of one woman who then went to Germany and signed a professional contract <coughs> somewhere in the 80s. And I heard it from from a colleague of her, from the son of a colleague of her. So it's more or less a first-hand story. Um, and in the uh, if you uh, that's the moment where I don't know some kind of worker self-organizing and and sports overlap. And if we already know that there is also the possibility because of so many new clubs emerging in in, in Eastern Europe. Or I'm more or less talking about Yugoslavia at this moment. It's to, to be more precise. There is more and more sport clubs emerging, um, uh, LGBT queer sport clubs. Uh, I would say that some kind of uh, 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 some line of thinking uh, 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 of also LGBT sport clubs that the space for them needs to be in finding uh, uh, um, in starting to find coalitions, um, as I already said, with other disempowered groups and somehow to actually bring the the, question, uh, the matter of sport somehow to bring it on the higher level of the uh, higher level of politics and uh, use the sport and all the personal gain you, you get from it also as a political tool of establishing some new coalitions uh, uh, um, and uh, 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 establishing all, actually those kinds of connections that come from very grassroots uh, 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 ways of organizing. This is in some more abstra uh, most abstract uh, uh, sense. Yeah, yeah, there is a way to be more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I just got reminded of one uh, interesting research by a fellow artist who is doing oral history of women's water polo in Spain uh, as his PhD work. 
within uh, classical history department. So I think it's very interesting how we can even speak about sports, like how we can talk about sports, especially in these minorities. It's, it's basically anecdotal. We don't have uh, a kind of research, we don't have uh, like means, uh, we don't have theories uh, that, that could really be applied uh, directly into this field. And what's interesting for for example, gay liberation uh, and this um, kind of 70s and 80s in, in the US and, and, and Western Europe, uh, that there has been a, a queer critique afterwards. There has been a way to opt out of normalization, a way to, to not think only in terms of let's fit in, let's uh, build bridges <laughs> also in a way. But also, let's see what we can build for ourselves and how, how we can build alternatives, not, not just um, kind of normalize. This is where I think for me it becomes more interesting because uh, it requires more imagination. Exactly. And, and somehow, without knowing what are the different histories, what are the different uh, realities in which we live, we cannot really imagine uh, alternatives. Uh, what was uh, kind of uh, really interesting uh, uh, when thinking about the history of, for example, gay games uh, that happened uh, 32 years ago, that the founder of gay games, although he himself identified as bisexual man, or, or, or I'm not sure if he was saying bisexual or gay, but he, he, he had a kid with a wife and he was... Uh, intellectual that he actually was, was kind of breaking down uh, barriers other than the gender uh, sexual orientation barriers. The fact that first gay games didn't have nation state representation as only option but also state teams and, and kind of city teams and, and people could march without uh, this kind of uh, national, uh, flag. national flags. This is, for example, a major breakthrough from the existing uh, system of Olympics. And he was Olympian. He could have just followed, uh, you know, whatever he saw in, in the Mexico Olympics when he was kicked out for supporting uh, the Black Power salute uh, guys. Uh, then it, it kind of made the, the history of gay sport much more interesting just by breaking out of this... Uh, changing. Yeah. Changing. It's an erotic situation, actually. Um, for the TLP, for example, for the first tournament, for example, uh, we have no... Uh, the competition are now for the... Um, for the research. We, the competition are because we want to play together. Uh, and that it's uh, one of the first um, values from the FSJ because we can play together <coughs> with any sense of uh, difference. Uh, for example, on the this anti discrimination section, uh, we have the uh, the way to increase, we are looking for increase the participation of trans people, but uh, any other, other kind of, of uh, of people that what uh, that can participate, for example, disabilities, uh, uh, any kind of disabilities. Um, we are looking for increased participation of the uh, uh, women, women's sport, women's sport, because it's you know, very representative in the in the, uh, in the competitions. And uh, we try to mix everybody, everybody to play together. That it's an evolution because, like you say, at the beginning it was just for men people uh, that playing uh, for the competition, and now it's uh, everybody can participate. It's a good evolution, and we have to work to continue because that's very. It, uh, it's by the educating people that we will find the way to uh, fight against discrimination because it's a, a the real topic inside it's a discrimination uh, we have to play 
together and uh, we have to make our work of communication. Would you say some of those the lines of you know, like that whole inclusiveness uh, uh, goes along emancipatory strategies? It, it, it becomes some kind of emancipatory strategy, which is super important because then it you know makes uh, possible some some bigger solidarity. Yes, uh, solidarity, uh, solidarity that builds up the solidarity, and that's I think one of the most important benefits that, that can come out of of uh, uh, the, the sport practice and and um, the, the, we need to regain sport for ourselves and to use it to, to, to build up new solidarity practices. I think it's, it's kind of double struggle for both to reclaiming sports as, as a different type of sport uh, in which we, we can participate. There yes. is an interesting, uh, from our experience of socialism because uh, uh, from 70s and 80s, it was such a normal thing that every city would have uh, a, a number of clubs supporting all kinds of different types of uh, athletics, gymnastics, mm -hmm. and everything. And now we are basically going into this monocultural uh, uh, situation where only sports who are super uh, commercially exploitable get to, 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 to be present. And, and I was living in Fortnum in, in this town that's 10,000 people, and you could practice gymnastics and athletics. Today, kids don't have a court for anything except uh, basketball and football, let alone to, 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 to do uh, obscure things like uh, athletics. Um, and in, in the same time, there is uh, emancipation to, to reclaim sport from which so many. Uh, because of commercialization, because of uh, kind of liberal trends in societies, we, we had like a, a, a tough break with this. Uh, but also uh, reclaiming uh, a, a kind of uh, the, the sport system in terms of that we don't have to wait for the sport federations to find space for us that we can self-regulate and self-organize. Mm -hmm. And, and this has been interesting uh, development within gay sport movement that I think was not uh, appreciated enough and is, is not kind of something that, that we learned from the fact that there is such event as gay games or out games or euro games that really uh, lives on, on, on voluntary work and, and has thousands of people uh, coming in for the weekend or for the week of competitions is amazing. Uh, but that we cannot build on this structure uh, further to, to make it uh, relevant, for example, as Pride uh, format is relevant for a street demonstration, or it at least it used to be historically, uh, it is something that's, I think, untapped uh, potential. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of difficulties with doing that, and one of them is that, you know, sports and culture excludes people who don't fit gender norms in particular. But then obviously the flip side of that, the obvious flip side of that, is that people who don't fit gender norms feel excluded by sport, mm -hmm. even if it's presented to them in a much more LGBT or queer-friendly context. Um, I mean, like I said at the start, I lived in Brighton, and uh, Brighton is very well known, having a very big and very visible LGBT and queer community. And yet we really found it almost impossible to find a team of 11 players who identified as LGB and or T. And actually the team was probably about half older gay men in their 40s and late 30s. Uh, me identifying as trans, and the rest of them were straight guns who realised if they played for a gay team, they could go and play in tournaments in Barcelona or <laughs> uh, and have a much more interesting time playing football as a kind of amateur Sunday league thing but, but than they could for a straight team. It's um, a brilliant situation, that it's something that is, uh, is <laughs> instead of being a sub position, it becomes super position. Well, it's great, yeah. because <laughs> it, 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 it so many... I am uh, not very good at football, but, yeah. I mean, I'm not terrible. Not, not great, and I've played at the World Cup, I've played at the European <laughs> Championships. <laughs> 
Uh, I've, I've been on the pitch at like Premier League football grounds and stuff. Uh, you know, I've met people who play for England in the FA. If I just played in a straight league, if in a Sunday league at the stand, like that, <laughs> I'd play against a pub team and then get drunk, and that would be the end. Um, so you know, the networks are there, and the um, the the sort of the things that would make alternative queer sport networks interesting and exciting for LGBT and queer people really do exist, but the difficulty is persuading people that uh, these networks are going to be friendly to them. And I mean, I played in the gay league for quite a long time, and in fact I train with a gay team in London now, um, and play for a men's team as a trans woman, and the, the structures actually allow me to do that, it's co is co-educational, so they allow female players in the men's teams. But in practice, it's very, very masculine. And actually, um, a lot of the time, I still feel confused by that. You know, we'll, we'll be preparing for a game, and the manager will say, right, boys, this is what we're doing. And I kind of like, don't have the energy to correct that every time <laughs> it happens. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of awkward. Um, but it's also difficult for me as an openly trans woman to play for a women's team as well because there are all sorts of um, issues around potential transphobia I might encounter if I kind of do well and people take exception to it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, you know, a hell of a lot of really, really good work's been done in creating alternative sporting spaces for queer people, but actually I think one of the biggest challenges is selling them to queer people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, that's the really serious thing. I mean, the, the, the persuading queer people that maybe it would be a good idea to go and do some sports or find a sports club is it's super difficult, and there is so much troubles. Or there's so much body troubles mm -hmm. in all. Uh, um, simply because queer people feel insanely vulnerable, especially if they are recognizable as queer in any sense. And in, in, in many societies and in many situations, uh, 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 probably with uh, uh, members of trans community, is the most, it's the most difficult. Uh, um, and at the same time, you have... Um, uh, uh, but it also applies to all vis visibly queer people, mm -hmm. and there is that discomfort with the body, there is that discomfort to actually go into something perceived as a straight setting, and then to, you know, I don't know, going to the gym could be such a huge trauma yeah. for somebody who doesn't have the perfect body, somebody who is visibly yes. queer, it's just, well, even going in the early morning hours when nobody's there, it's, it's also not the option. Mm -hmm. Long before that as well, I mean, I think most kind of LGBT and queer people would tell you they had a bad time at school. But if you ask any of those people what the worst thing was at school, they will always say sport. Sport. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, that's very uh, important for trans people. The, um, the first thing that uh, trans people ask why they don't uh, practice sport is myself. Myself, why I don't want to do uh, practice sport. The first thing is because uh, we have to um, to go through the think about what I think about sport. Um, sport is masculine. Sometimes we say it's very masculine. So if I practice sport, I will have a, like a body like a man. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, what what the other people think about me uh, is the perception of myself. Um, the third thing that we think about uh, about do or not do uh, practice sport is uh, I will have to show my ID. Uh, if my ID is, is not uh, still in the um, gender that I uh, desired, it would be uh, something very violent to, to show 
to make a description uh, in, a, in a top spot. Um, the the uh, the other thing that uh, why don't the why trans people don't practice sport is because uh, the others the others um, what they think about me um, uh, if I practice for example uh, a swimming pool as I go to um, the swimming pool I have to show my body uh, and sometimes it's very uh, difficult because uh, we can be uh, Blinded uh, by the other people, when you are here, you are, you are not a man, you are not a lady, so what you are doing here, uh, so it's transphobia. transphobia. Um, even in, the, in, the, in a trans friendly environment, even. Uh, um, uh, and the transphobia is because the, <coughs> the people don't know. Trans people, they have uh, images about what is uh, transgender people, and uh, they make some uh, limits to acceptation. Um, um, and the trans people don't practice because it's very young. It's very young to, to, to go uh, in a and show the red bells and uh, explain what they. The, their feelings, uh, explain that uh, they are in transition, explain her uh, in gender identity, etc. It's very exhausting. It's very exhausting. That's why uh, some, sometimes they don't, they prefer to not, don't practice sport. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to that from personal experience. I mean, I used to play football an awful lot pre transition, you know, two or three times a week. And then when I started transitioning, I stopped for quite a long time because, you know, in order to reduce my gender dysphoria and to feel safe navigating public space, I would have to spend a lot of time doing my hair and makeup and dressing in a certain way. And sport just made that completely impossible. And after about a year, I started playing football again with mm. friends at the local university where I lived. And they were all fine, actually. And then I came out to the all as trans. Because your question is about uh, passing. Yeah. Yes. Um, I pass or I pass not. Uh, and uh, so that's very important. Uh, transgender people that have a good passing, mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, will be able to practice sport mm -hmm. yeah. easily than another that has not a uh, good passing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And there's you know levels of privilege there and, and things to think about. But um, you know, if I played football with my friends, even if my friends were fine with it, I couldn't use the changing room, so I'd have to turn up in my kit uh, and leave in my kit, which made me feel really dysphoric and made me feel I wasn't passing and made me very anxious. And then, of course, if I run around for an hour and a half and I can't use a shower or do anything after, then, you know, I get covered in sweat and my hair goes crazy and my makeup comes off and, you know, I don't look good and I don't feel good about myself and I feel vulnerable going to and from the exercise space, or even if the space itself is barely safe, which it was really, you know, I came out to everyone and it was fine. What I got wrong was turning up first, because then I was sat there waiting to play, and I was like, oh, I'm Juliet now, I'm living as female, and then they all came one by one, I had to come out to 16 people um, <laughs> in, in different goes, so I always turn up last, um, and then just say it, and they're already playing, so they won't care what you say to them. Um, that's put you in goal. Uh, <laughs> Timing. Yeah, absolutely. It's everything. Yeah. Five minutes into the game, come then, and you're, you're sorted. But um, <laughs> they won't care what you say. Uh, but but yeah, you know, it's it, it's it's these. There are all sorts of really strange ways in which sport. Um, sort of intersects with the problems of cross-gender living uh, in ways that you really couldn't predict. I mean, when I started transitioning and going to professional football games and playing football and running and stuff, I foresaw some of these issues. But, you know, not all of them, not even many of them, really. And the things I thought would be big problems in that, you know, I thought it might be a problem that people like just play football with 
would refuse to accept me. That actually mm -hmm. wasn't that big an issue. But, but sometimes if the feeling of security, I would be, uh, would be in security in this car or not. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that. Uh, I have a, an example. For example, uh, last year I was very happy for the Paris tournament and uh, for the uh, for this season. I had a, a new member of my dad and uh, a trans woman uh, and uh, uh, another one a trans uh, uh, man and I uh, we asked we uh, we was talking about uh, transition and I asked why you are coming in this club uh, uh, and they they uh, they say me because you are here mm. we are we are, we are the feeling of security uh, because they know that I was working uh, into the into the anti discrimination section. Uh, that's that's something that it's very important for trans people be in security. In security. I think uh, what puts huge difference for for especially for a trans, uh, but also for for. Uh, queer people is that they have a kind of micro environment around them of people who are supporters. So even if they are in the larger context, at some points that they already have a kind of support network around them. I remember, uh, for me, the most unique uh, gay sport experience uh, was actually in playing uh, very much or very men kind of. Uh, uh, body fetishizing kind of uh, uber bench uh, Milano tournament, you know, where each Italian team tries to look uh, you know, the most fabulous possible. <laughs> and, and then there is a Peruvian uh, uh, immigrant team that has half of the team uh, of, of trans people. And I think even one or two uh, are sex workers, at least that was the story. And they were the only team that actually had supporters. They were, they had families with them, they had kids with them, and they had like, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 fans, and none of these macho, uh, you know, super model, uh, good looking guys had anyone to cheer for them. They were just like hating each other in all different ways. And, and this was an amazing uh, team that were playing one level higher than me. I'm not an amazing volleyball player, but they were like really amazing. And uh, that was kind of a eye opener how, how they can emancipate in society. I mean, they, Italians in general mostly discriminate uh, Latin American, especially the lower class kind of uh, uh, immigrants, but then it's within gay environments they are again discriminated and then there is this uh, trans layer and then there is this layer of, of being a sex worker so there's like multiplicity of, of, of discrimination that could apply but because they have this environment of like I think there was at least five kids cheering for them and then the, the parents of the kids and then you know family that was like really mind-blowing uh, that's super, uh, super interesting, uh, uh, exactly because it tells about, you know, that, that's the possibility of different sports. That's the sport that you exercise as some kind of community building mm -hmm. and as some kind of communicative practice and I don't know what else. Uh, and it's opposed to what we usually understand as sport as something professionalized, competitive, um, pretty much macho, uh, closed for all possible different groups, and also it's completely, it's a different view of the sport, it's actually, uh, when we today talk about sport, well, we, in the media, uh, the stories about famous, I don't know, football players, professionals, uh, uh, um, they're usually presented in this kind of you know, chasing for the dream, becoming the star, coming from the lower classes, climbing up the social ladder up to the top. Uh, 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 and it, it's presented as emancipatory potential of the sport, which brings so many people wanting to you know, uh, become that one big superstar, one Cristiano Ronaldo or whoever else. While at the same time, we, are pretty, we can be pretty much aware of the whole 
uh, lie, uh, 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 how that whole narrative is constructed as a huge capitalist lie, basically. And, uh, 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 and so we should leave that as, as you know, false emancipatory politics and maybe look more towards this kind of emancipatory politics in the sport which actually involves the whole community within that court and enables, uh, leaves behind competitiveness and, and uh, 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 con concepts like that and actually uh, 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 works on the, yeah, okay building the networks and, and bonds. I'm super interested in how we can actually uh, make this super composition instead of being sub-sport, sub-community, to, to be the ec excellence, to be like the, the sport uh, example, even if we think in, in queer terms that we don't have to be like best practice in existing uh, rules and regulations and, and and because th this is what most of the, unfortunately, uh, gay sport organizers tend to try to fit in existing leagues, existing regulations, uh, and sometimes it's just like not an option. For example, men synchronized swimming is, is not allowed on international level because they just it will not have any time. Once it's set up in the UK, there's a men's synchronized yeah, swimming team. The, there are people yeah. individually competing mm. locally yeah. and in gay competitions, but there, there is no yes, way they will get recognized any time soon. Maybe maybe a decade. And what was also the case on, on the, the, some Olympics now or, or on the, some uh, championship? I didn't follow exactly, but I know that there was a story about that this was the first time that, uh, I don't know, synchronized the jumping uh, in the swimming pool or something like that was allowed for women. So anyway, some, some kind of, of, yeah. of sport, uh, which I do not know exactly which one, <laughs> it, uh, was allowed uh, uh, to have its female competition now oh, in 2014. Ski jumps. Yeah, it was winter Olympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but I, I think uh, this is interesting when, when this okay, can be we'll politicized. When, when people who take part in gay, uh, lesbian, be trans, queer sport can see themselves as political subjects rather than <laughs> objects and, and kind of uh, present their uh, claims to the wider public, why, for example, there was a synchronized, not, it was aquatics uh, master uh, championship in Eindhoven uh, half a year ago, so master championship means it's people over 35, so not competitive, not high level in that sense, that they have passed their peak time, they have retired, and they only do this for fun more or less. And uh, there was a couple, uh, male, female couple, wanted to do synchronized swimming performance at the end of competition, just as like gala thing to entertain people, and they were not allowed because the organizer thought, okay, this is political provocation. <laughs> so, so we are we are in the field that has so much political and so much uh, financial tensions. Um, and I think if we just leave it inside of its own bracket, inside of its own island of gay and lesbian uh, sport, it's too little. Sorry, could I say something? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I think one of the problems in the UK that we um, experience is that um, sport is so heteronormative in school and so restrictive and alienating to most LGBT people that, certainly from my own experience, but I've, I see this borne out in other ways. So I played sport all the way through school, did fairly well, was completely okay, came out as a lesbian when I was about 21 in the 1980s. And for me, there was a distinct kind of choice between two things. I could either be a sporty dyke or I could be a political guy. And, for, and they're the twain shall meet, that, that you couldn't be both of those things. Um, and I found sport really alienating as a lesbian because at that time within British culture, you know, we, had, we were living in Section 28 um, and um, 
the lesbians in sport were very cliquey um, because they were frightened to be open about their sexuality. And yet the political lesbians were very in your face and very open. And so I found that a more welcoming environment. But that's just my personal experience. But on a, on a kind of, um, on a more current experience, what I see is that um, those more radical people from our communities end up being so alienated by sport by the time they reach adulthood that then there are very few radical people and political, politicised people who stay in sport and to a certain extent the people who stay in sport, the LGB, LGB people who stay in sport certainly, are people who can survive in that heteronormative environment and can survive in certainly male, in some male sports in the UK in a hyper-masculinist environment. And then everybody else kind of has fallen away from that. And so you get very little kind of crossover. So like, for example, Juliet is one of the few people I know who has played sport, really loves football, really enjoys that experience, and is very political as well, in a, with a small p, you know. But we are few and far between in the UK. And I think that that's the dynamic that... How do we, you know, what's really brilliant for me about being in this room is there's a whole load of people here, I don't know if they're even interested in sport, but they're here talking about these issues. In the UK, this wouldn't happen. You know, there'd be three people here, probably, listening to this discussion. I know, because I put on events like this and no one comes, you know. Um, but, you know and I talking to each other. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. That's coffee, that's not... Um... <laughs> No, but I think it, it's a niche from which we are all struggling, of course. But, uh, for example, in Zagreb, I remember uh, seven, eight years ago, when, when Q Sport was starting, there were five, six, eight of us for first year, and most of us had either activist or cultural background. Mm -hmm. Like, we did sports, uh, and we were kind of informed, but we were not kind of mainstream average Joes and Janes and, and that kind of uh, position made us also think okay let's do it in a queer way let's not call it a gay or, or lesbian group let's call it a queer group and whoever joins us thinking it's gay lesbian will give them like one year <laughs> to convert them to queers <laughs> But then we keep them out. <laughs> well, I wonder, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to pick up some points there that Lou's just brought in. Uh, you know, I instinctively love football. It's probably my favourite thing. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are two ways in which football really alienates me. And one is the gender norms and the norms of sexuality and how they clash with my own gender and sexuality. But the other is how the structures of professional football mm -hmm. absolutely disgust me as a kind of anti-capitalist. I mean, luckily, you know, I, I support a club that is still locally owned, um, uh, Norwich City, who I support in the Premier League now, and they're still owned by people who I find just about acceptable. Um, but, I mean, for example, uh, I mean, some of you may, may be familiar with this guy, a guy called Giovanni Di Stefano, who tried to buy the club about 10 years ago. And he's known as acting as lawyer for the worst people in the world. So he defended um, Arkan, um, Saddam Hussein's sons. Um, but, uh, and this guy wanted to buy my football team. Uh, how would I go and watch a club that's owned by someone like that? Um, and so to have, yeah, kind of radical politics and activism around sports when you're wanting to reduce homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, etc., in the most visible elements of those sports, which are the top end, which are very hyper-capitalist, is really difficult. And in the kind of activism I've done, I've done lots of kind of radical and queer activism you know, making interventions into pride or things when they get too commercial or too caught up with the army or the police or something like that, um, which in Britain they really do. I mean, the army and the police recruit at Brighton Pride and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I talk and I write a lot about radical queer anti-capitalism. But I do feel that a lot of people 
learn their values from sport and get excluded from sport very early on because it's so kind of heteronormative uh, and gender normative. Uh, but in order to change that, it does mean working with really, really big companies um, and working with a political system that I find reprehensible. Um, I don't really know a way around that. Well, we can easily imagine the situation that within 10 years or 15 or something like that, the same thing might happen with the sport that already happened with, for example, pride, for example, the whole marriage equality thing, like the whole, let's name it, I don't know, a simul simulative uh, commercial uh, stream of gay politics, the, the, this mainstream gay politics is going towards constantly, okay, let's take this privilege for ourselves and this privilege for ourselves without recognizing that as the privilege, but, you know, just fighting for, okay, let's have marriage rights without even maybe questioning, it's like this most painful thing, without maybe questioning why would there be any division between married and non-married people, but uh, uh, um, without maybe questioning those, you know, social constructs uh, lying behind that. And um, I can maybe imagine the situation where within 20 years you're going to have openly gay athletes all around the place, the, uh, you know, being uh, uh, pictured naked on the covers of Advocate or some other mainstream magazine or something. Okay, no problem, beautiful, fine. But if it, uh, 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 that maintains within this horrible professional sport frame in which contemporary sport is organized, then I'm somehow I cannot be very happy with that kind of development, and uh, I don't know. I would more incline towards imagining other possibilities and other ways of organizing, and how the, the, this this is all what we're talking about all the time. How to actually reclaim the sport for ourselves without that that awful professional surreal uh, uh, frame. I have. A I have a question, um, maybe it's for all of you. Uh, not considering schools as uh, maybe in orthodox Marxist terms, that uh, it's a state of the art writers, but to consider them as a battlefield that you can claim your own space where the sport, sports education is not yet professionalized. How would you imagine maybe for in 10 years that maybe queer sport, like Jacob's project would be a part of the curriculum. Uh, is it possible to even imagine this uh, for a future project? Our future project is to create uh, new events, the inclusive events. And uh, with saying that we are not woman, man, transgender people, but everybody is a human. That's the inclusive. And that, and that, that even it can be possible, would be possible, the, because the empowerment, we have to take the empowerment of the communities. We have to show the, the, the way to do that. There are uh, positive examples, surprisingly, in schools that we are not widely familiar with. Uh, for example, in the in, uh, uh, Netherlands, north, like Flemish part of Bel Belgium uh, and western north Germany, there is a sport that's well known, only there, nowhere else, called korfball, uh, which by its rules uh, is, is uh, gender, how do you say this, gender balanced. <laughs> Uh, because it, it requires for each team to have three male and three female, uh, so, so three girls and three boys. It's only played with like very young population, like very with kids. It's not really developed as adult sport. So it's interesting, like they would play together in elementary school this, and this would be one of the most popular sports. It's not like something obscure that you would do here and there. Uh, but they have like school leagues and everything like this. But then when they grow up, they grow up into, uh, you know, sexed male or female and never uh, compete. Uh, yeah, I mean, the issue of um, 
kind of co-ed sports and the division of male and female sports from an incredibly young age, uh, I think it's really important. I mean, um, I know people who kind of say that, you know, misogyny, homophobia, biphobia and transphobia, you know, they all come down to the same thing. It's all to kind of scorn of femaleness and femininity. Um, and lots of people who feel excluded from a very early age of school um, are kind of young people, like born male, who play boys' sports, who are constantly being kind of ridiculed or attacked for being weak or for not wanting to get kind of stuck into the sport or not wanting to get dirty or not wanting to uh, meet these kind of very male and masculine expectations. And a lot of female-born people who are alienated from sport early on because they're sort of made to feel um, that you know the the way their gender enacts itself in sport is inappropriate, um, and kind of co-ed sport, I think, would undermine an awful lot of the basis behind that. Um, you know, you would very quickly, uh, you know, see that. You know, the kind of um, sort of aggression and humiliation um, that is used to marginalise people in sport based on their kind of gender, um, the bottom of that would fall out if you have boys and girls playing together and it quickly becomes clear that some girls are better than some boys and gender is not necessarily... Um, you know, a marker of kind of male and masculine good, female and feminine bad, um, in the way that I think for a lot of younger people playing sport, it is. Um, that strikes me as both the sort of easiest and most difficult way to deal with the problem. The easiest because, you know, you, you flick one thing and it's different, but the hardest because that's so socially ingrained. Um, you know, getting persuading people that there is no need to divide sport into male and female is going to take a really long time. Yeah, yeah something like that would probably be also my answer to the question. I, I cannot imagine something like that happening in the in the states in the schools as you know something that is so strongly held by the state if the state itself doesn't go through some unimaginable revolution and completely turns away the gender. Uh, 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 the whole teaching about gender and and uh, you know starts applying seriously feminist politics and becomes some uh, I don't know revolutionarily progressive state that at this moment we cannot imagine that it exists. But some other fronts can be opened also around the schools and maybe some small interventions can I don't know somehow underneath enter them and also all the schools are in, uh, placed within certain neighborhoods and uh, some, uh, uh, maybe there is also more work to be done in the neighborhood itself uh, 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 among the kids who actually go to the school uh, but work you know, with the community that is uh, 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 somehow closer, easier to reach or uh, possible to make some kind of grassroots connection, connections whatever. Again, you know, abstract terms, but... Any questions for Yeah, I, I have one question, but not completely directly related uh, to all this, but um, I'm a founder of Fervolo de Ljubljana, uh, one of the founders, I have to say, uh, which is, a, uh, I don't know if you all know it, but it's like um, really open to specifically the LGB T, not so much, but LGBT community, let's say. Um, um, we have um, a small group of people now, we have like around 14 people, which um, quite some uh, openly uh, lesbian. Um, and the Roller Derby is known for uh, activism as well. Um, also, like feminism, um, LGBT, LGBT. Um, but a lot of people join us now, um, uh, feminists, uh, lesbians, gays, and so on, um, because they feel that they can join that, they are accepted, and uh, we like that because we want to uh, show that we're open to LGBT, but they join us, and then 
they sit there and they don't do any activism within our uh, club anymore. And I was actually searching for how we can, yeah, do you have any suggestions how to um, make them, I don't want to make them, but you know what I mean, like open up uh, inside the club as well. Because some of them are, for example, also organizing this, this uh, festival, but inside the club nothing much is happening at the moment. We're really searching for a way, because actually the, the people who are uh, most into the activism are the straight people in the club. Um, and the other way around, we'd like to have like everybody incorporated in that, this activist idea. And we need some suggestions how to, yeah, how to yeah. make this work. I mean, we, we found with the Bright Bandits and the Justin campaign growing out of it, you can't make do it. Um, I mean, Jason at the start in particular was very, very, um, very, very keen. Yes, uh, you know, and he really wanted everybody to join in the work of the Justin campaign, um, and lots of the other players for the gay football team were saying we don't want this to become about politics. And my argument was, look, you're playing for a gay football team in a separate league, like. That's a political decision that you've made, um, and I think I just got told to like pipe down. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, all you can really do, I guess, is make it very, very clear that the door is open for people to get involved in um, more overtly activist work that grows out of the team, uh, and I guess manage those kind of conflicts that come out of that as they come up. I mean, we, we managed to strike quite a good balance between the three of us doing the Justin campaign and playing for the Bandits in a way that allowed us to carry on campaigning, uh, but also playing for the team without the team being taken over by the campaign in a way that alienated the players that didn't want to be involved with the campaign. Um, I think it's really about being very vocal about those options. Mm -hmm. we, we had similar situation and, and I had similar uh, interest. Uh, it, it, it's really hard because all the activists we, that would join us were so much die-hard act, activists that they were already kind of burned out by their uh, either professional activism or their long-term commitments that they would just like want to swim and not to talk about it. <laughs> uh, and on the other side we had people who were totally closeted. For them it was kind of, wow, they actually met someone not who walks the pride but who organizes the pride. So it was like fully like, uh, as, 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 as radical as it can get. And uh, yeah, the best thing that happened in years uh, is that uh, we get we get more people to understand that they cannot be political, that there is no an option, you can only be passive or, or kind of ignore the situation around you or you can embrace it and then do what you can when, when you can. Um, and that they also learn to deal with the situation that uh, you don't have to be full-time committed either to sport in our group, you can easily drop uh, a practice and then still be welcome or, or to each of the activities. So when someone asks us what Q sport is, I usually say that it's both uh, kind of activist endeavor for some and cultural and social and even touristic to go around <laughs> Europe and to obscure. Why well, focus on sports activism? The yeah. perks are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so it, it's Everyone has its own priority. The most important thing is that everyone realizes that it has all of these qualities and that you can use all of these qualities. We have many people who are uh, like professional artists uh, in Croatia, like super well known, like one of the, the best uh, co contemporary uh, performance and uh, kind of uh, conceptual artists are part of our group, actors, uh, and yet uh, the people who, who do creative work within a group don't feel intimidated. They feel like, wow, we can do, you know, exhibitions as a sport club. We can do performances like music uh, things as a, as a sport club. But this is 
uh, kind of emancipatory in that way that they can learn about civil society without being an NGO uh, person. You know, they can still keep their corporate job. They can still work in a bank and be boring eight hours a day. But then, like when they come in the evening, they can like dress up and be in drag or, or like go to tournaments and be ridiculous and uh, whatever it takes. And this is, uh, yeah. The, 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 the combination of all the things makes think, uh, and, and we have people uh, evolving from um, Lou and few other people know uh, Boris from, from Q Sport, uh, who is actually this year our representative at the uh, annual assembly, uh, and we had this kind of a historic session. We were looking at the early days of Q Sport and files. And, and he was like really upset that he was not in the first 20 people who were registered as members. And we never really cared, we didn't, never had like really formal membership. But okay, Boris was upset and he's like the most important person now. And then we realized he didn't give us his name for first uh, year and a half. So this is why he was not in the member of this. But five years later, he's like carrying flags on Euro games. He is the, the coordinator of three out of four activities. <laughs> and, and like, it takes a while for some people to, to, to really, but you, know, you can only be patient or, or you lose the time. Questions? You have the impression like that to continue to work, So I'm not sure if we managed to uh, conclude anything. I think we, we had some. still worked. <laughs> <laughs> like the uh, European Gay Lesbian Sports Federation uh, actually is uh, kind of trying to, to make steps in the direction of, of diversifying topics it, 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 it works with. And, and uh, with two other people part of the diversity committee <laughs> and uh, we would actually like to do more of these kind of events and more practical events and I would invite you if you have con if you have further interest in following on this to keep in touch and uh, this year on the island of Vis we will try to do a, a kind of a let's say working conference and, and camp uh, uh, in, in direction of, of gender uh, uh, discrimination in, in terms of uh, creative uh, activism and in terms of networking uh, different struggles uh, as like three topics of, of, of an event around uh, swimming marathon that we do on 16th of August and the Green Academy, uh, that's a big political environmental conference that's happening on 23rd. So if you are free, if you are available, if you want to join us, uh, please do it. It's like super inclusive, <laughs> self-organized event. Um, this is the, the program tomorrow of workshops that is happening on the Building Bridges conferences. I don't know if you see anything that's interesting or if you can read I can just read briefly it's about invisible diversity strategies uh, in Central and Eastern Europe sustainable cooperation between LGBTIQ and mainstream sport youth and education against homophobia in sport innovative campaigning against homophobia in the world of sport so if you are if you care for, for some of these topics I think you can still uh, join I don't think they have like a really uh, uh, strict regulations about popping into, into one of the sessions so thank you for for taking part do, do you have something to invite you to no.